I'm Phil Hopkins, I'm from the BJA, and welcome to the latest BJA broadcast. Now, in this broadcast, uh, we're going to focus on uh, the December 2021 issue of the BJA. And you can see uh, on this slide uh, the cover of that particular issue, um, and very dramatically announcing that one of the topics covered is anaphylaxis. And that's because two of the papers in uh, the December 2021 issue uh, deal with uh, aspects of perioperative anaphylaxis. And you can see on the right hand side of um, that uh, panel the titles and authors of the two papers. So we have um, the top one is the incidence and risk factors for near fatal and fatal outcomes after perioperative periprocedural anaphylaxis in the USA. And the one below is um, the drug allergy labels in elective surgery patients, a prospective multicenter cross-sectional study of prevalence, nature, and anesthetist approach in management. Now, um, I do have to declare that I've got an interest in the second of those papers, as the eagle-eyed of you will spot that I'm one of the authors. Um, but I'm going to uh, pretend that I'm a neutral chair and I've got um, two of my colleagues who are going to represent the authors on that uh, paper. Both papers I provided the QR code for you to go direct to the full text or the PubMed ID and DOI if you prefer that route. So, um, first of all, I'd like to uh, ask my colleagues from the United States um, to introduce themselves and then my colleagues from Leeds. Thanks, Phil. Uh, my name is Jerry Volchek. I'm a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic Medical School and chair of the Division of Allergic Diseases at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I'm Alexei Gonzalez. I'm one of uh, the consultants in allergy and clinical immunology in the Florida campus of the Mayo Clinic and an assistant professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine. Louise? Hi, I'm Louise Savage, and I'm an NIHR doctoral fellow in perioperative drug allergy and a consultant anesthetist in Leeds. Hi, I'm Caroline Thomas. I'm a consultant in anesthesia in Leeds. Excellent. So um, now, obviously, um, we're all, in, all interested in, in perioperative um, uh, allergy, perioperative anaphylaxis. Um, and uh, I think we're going to talk about um, the importance um, of the field um, as we go through. But first of all, um, I'm going to ask um, perhaps Jerry if you could give the, the background and uh, to your study and the gaps in knowledge you were trying to address. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Uh, perioperative anaphylaxis is is to me, a, a very interesting subject, but one that's been very difficult to study because it, it doesn't happen real often. Um, it's one in every 5,000 to 10,000 surgeries or procedures, but its implications are huge, you know, right at the time for the patient and the team, but then also too for, for subsequent surgeries down the road. In the US, we don't have some of the advantages that other countries have in studying you know, this whole process. We don't really have a specialized network like they have you know, in the UK, France, uh, Denmark, Australia uh, to really gather all these cases together. We're kind of left with individual studies from, from separate medical centers. And there really wasn't much at all in the literature about you know, either causes or even more importantly, uh, near fatal and, and fatal reactions during perioperative uh, anaphylaxis until about the last 10 years. And fortunately, we now are seeing some papers coming out uh, about this. But when you look at the numbers, you know, as expected, they're, they're very small. With our original study, it's been about 10 years ago now, you know, we reported on 38 patients and subsequent centers in the US such as the Cleveland Clinic had, you know, about 30 patients, uh, a combination of the Boston hospitals, about 100 patients. And in those papers, they talked about primarily, well, what caused the perioperative anaphylaxis? 
but didn't always break it down into the near fatal and, and fatal reactions. And interestingly too, in those papers where they describe uh, these patients, there were no reports of actual fatal events. We know they occur because when you look at the worldwide literature on it, the mortality in perioperative anaphylaxis is anywhere from two to 9%. But yet, you know, really here in the United States, we, we had no data at all on it. So one of our questions or was, you know, one, how often do near fatal and fatal reactions occur in perioperative anaphylaxis? And then also, are there risk factors for it? You know, again, uh, the worldwide literature did identify some risk factors for the fatal uh, reactions, including uh, things like male uh, gender, uh, non-elective procedures, hypertension, and other cardiovascular related uh, surgeries. Um, but again, in, in the United States, we, we weren't sure. And the kind of the interesting thing too is in the US studies, what we were finding is causative wise, it appeared that antibiotics were more common or the most common cause as opposed to the neuromuscular blocking agents, which tended to be the most common causes in, in other countries that were reporting on this. Now this needle has changed a little bit over time, but there, there does seem to be somewhat of a dichotomy there. And that raised the question in our mind too, is would our fatal and near fatal reactions be the same as what's being seen in the worldwide literature, uh, given that we, we know we have maybe some different pecking order of causes here uh, in the US, and could that translate also into maybe other things that would be different as far as these more serious reactions? Thanks, Jerry. I think, I think one of the things that you've highlighted there is um, implicitly that the definition of anaphylaxis implies a, a life-threatening reaction. And that's a key thing in, in defining the epidemiology because there are um, non-life-threatening hypersensitivity and allergic reactions. Um, and it, it's really important to, to separate um, the, the severity and know that we're talking about the same, uh, the, the same phenomenon when we're comparing da data from different countries. Brilliant. Alexi, um, so Jerry said how difficult it is to do this type of work. How did you go about it? Yes, thank you, Phil. So, uh, so we came out with this idea of trying to use a database that is called the NIS. It's the National Inpatient Sample Database, which is one of the largest databases available in the United States. Uh, it's, it's managed by something called the HCOOP. If you Google HCOOP, you can find out more about this, this uh, database. But basically, this is uh, around 1,200 hospitals around the US. They provide around 20% 20, 20 of their data every year based on ICD-9 coding, especially before 2015, of course. And after that is ICD-10. Uh, and they provide, you know, all most of their data, and you can see outcomes data, you can see mortality data, uh, cost of the hospital stay, length of stay, they have all these comorbid conditions. And what we did was we decided to go 10 years back just from 2005, 2014, and you, you get all these ICD codes. So what they actually do on the database, there's something very smart. There's something called uh, clinical classification software where they put all these ICD codes into a specific three digit coding to make it more practical for us. Say like you wanna just study uh, a cabbage, for example. So you have for cabbage, you have multiple ICD codes, but they actually put them in a bucket. So it's nice for us to just say, we're gonna classify cabbage, we're gonna get a left heart cath and we're gonna just put it in the cardiac bucket for us. So from that, we extract, extracted that data and we ended up with 35 million surgeries, which is a very nice, huge database. From there, we actually extracted with the ICD-9 code of anaphylaxis, which is 995.0. Uh, patients who were hospitalized had surgery and also had anaphylaxis during that surgical episode. And we ended up with around 5,000 uh, perioperative anaphylaxis cases. 
And even further, we wanted to really make it a little bit more accurate. So we removed from that 5,000 patients, we removed patients who had non perioperative anaphylaxis fatal and non fatal episodes to make it a little bit more accurate for us to actually get the accurate incidence of non fatal and fatal cases. Are there any particular um, risks or um, downsides with that, that type of approach? Yes, uh, there, there are several ones, there are several limitations. Um, so one of them would be that maybe the patient had anaphylaxis from something else, right? It could be that the patient had surgery, he did fine. He had a surgical site infection, they get another antibiotic and they have anaphylaxis for other causes. So you run into that. Another other thing, it could be on the report, as we all know, and one of your papers with Dr. Savick actually points that out, how it's commonly underreported. So uh, we based it just on ICD coding. So possibly a lot of reactions might be missed. That's another point. And obviously this is ICD-9 coding data. There might be mistakes with the coding as well. Yeah, I don't think there's, uh, there is a perfect methodology for uh, looking at such rare phenomena. Um, so Jerry, Alexi, what, what were the, the, the principal findings that interested you most? So uh, I think what we found, uh, the, the main findings are gonna be, I think, two, uh, threefold. It's gonna be the first finding is gonna be the actual percentage of patients that had non-fatal and fatal, which is around 7%. 5% of them are gonna be non-fatal. And we define non-fatal as any patient with preoperative anaphylaxis that ended up with a cardiac arrest episode or respiratory arrest or tracheostomy. And nobody got tracheostomy actually on the cohort. And the fatal uh, rate was 2%, which is consistent with other studies in the literature. And we ended up with a rate of both non-fatal and fatal of 1.26 cases per 100,000 cases. That's finding number one. The second most important finding was actually comparing the kids that had non-fatal and fatal anaphylaxis versus the ones that don't. And we found that compared to those that don't have fatal or non-fatal episodes, there's an increase on the age. So they have eight years, are eight years older than the ones that are controls. There's an increased length of stay of around three days more. And the admission obviously was cost, more, more, more costly, were around $40,000 more than the controls. And finally, the third one, which I think it's also very important is, you know, try to figure out the risk factors. So which patients that have anaphylaxis are at risk of having a worse outcome, which includes non-fatal and fatal. So the first one was age. So if you're 65 years or older, there's an increased risk of having fatal and non-fatal perioperative anaphylaxis. The second one was if you were undergoing a cardiac procedure. And finally, the third one are other, other outcomes that I won't get into. It's actually on the paper, you can read them. But I wanna really point out those two ones. The, uh, the odds ratios were Kai, and it, it makes sense with all the data that we have for anaphylaxis from all other causes. There's a very good paper from Paul Turner from the UK actually, where he goes into risk factors for drug-induced anaphylaxis, which is correlated very nicely with our, with our paper findings. And one thing that is very interesting, if you are uh, very nerdy into this topic as we are, which, which we love this, uh, there's a paper from the French group where they actually found that if you have muscle relaxant induced anaphylaxis, it's most likely to happen in males and in females. We tried to look at this and the uni univariable analysis, we did find the same thing. We found that females were actually kind of protected against this, but we lost it on the multivariable analysis, unfortunately. So we can't really say that that's actually correct from our cohort. So I think we have to have further studies, especially prospective studies, which are also very difficult to perform. Anything you'd like to add, Jerry? Yeah, so too, you know, we were also looking, uh, are there any surprises, you know, given, you know, some of the difference in causality that we've seen depending on regions. Um, but I would say there were no major surprises here and, and what we were finding from a percentage standpoint and then also kind of from a risk factor standpoint were, were pretty consistent with, with what has been reported. And it is, I, you know, as Lexi was just pointing out too, it's just kind of interesting, you know, from the, um, male-female standpoint, even though this 
condition seems to be more common in females than, than males. It was the, the males that seemed to be at the higher risk for the near fatal or fatal um, reactions associated with perioperative anaphylaxis. Sure. I think it's it's going to be really interesting when you can when you can get a handle on um, the relative impact of the different causative agents as well. Um, just to see if if those differences that you suggest between antibiotics and NMBAs um, that you you mentioned previously do um, uh, are, are real um, or they're just perceived. Um, so. Uh, Great. Okay. Thanks. I mean, I, before we move on, I don't know whether Louise or Caroline, you want to just um, pick out anything there. I mean, one one thing that really grabbed me from um, from the study is that this is the first time that we've 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 had some cost impacts um, mm. imposed on um, perioperative um, anaphylaxis, and clearly these are really useful when we're trying to persuade funders. Um, to support further research um, into the problem. Yeah, absolutely. It struck me as well that it, it's really interesting how you've come up with the same broad figure that, that always seems to you know, be arrived at when people look at the incidence of perioptive anaphylaxis. So one in 10,000 seems to be you know, the figure that always you, know, you come up with. But um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Alexei, there, there was, you know, we have done work that shows that that is likely to be significantly underreported and, and the the problem here is we don't know how to really improve that. You know, it's quite it's quite a tough nut to crack, isn't it? So we're I think we're always at risk of underreporting. Great. Okay. So, uh, Louise, perhaps if I I could um, ask you to continue with a slight change of um, change of gear, yeah. um, and uh, talk about the, the the Dales project and the the problem of erroneous drug allergy labels. Yeah, so this project really came about because we recognise that it, as well as this problem of uh, rare but life-threatening anaphylaxis, so real drug allergy reactions that happen during the perioptive period, there's this whole parallel problem of people coming to theatre already carrying labels of drug allergy, which on first appearance, you know, I, I think the universal experience for everyone working in healthcare and no less in the surgical field is that you look at most of these labels and think that's really unlikely to be a true allergy label. So there seems to be an enormous problem with over labeling, um, but we haven't yet in the UK at least defined that problem. Uh, and we haven't defined what the, the impact of that, if there is any, if there is any impact on, on perioptive prescribing and, and longer term outcomes for patients. So what we were trying to do with this study is really to put a figure to how many patients come to theatre with a drug allergy label, and then to do it with relatively broad brushstrokes, try and identify how many of those patients actually have a label that's likely to represent true allergy. Uh, and alongside that, we wanted to explore um, anaesthetists' understanding and knowledge around drug allergy. And the, the emphasis was actually on penicillin allergy. And that, that part of the study, the penicillin allergy part of the study, was such a big piece of work on its own that that's, in fact, a separate publication that we're not, um, we're not really discussing today. But, uh, but we, we looked at uh, anaesthetist knowledge and understanding and some of the systems problems around drug allergy with, with the use of uh, wristbands. Uh, in, in all the different sites that we looked at. So it was, it was multifactorial, but we were really just trying to pin down a problem which people experience every day, but we haven't really defined yet. But I'll, I'll let Caroline explain more of the detail of that. Um, thank you. So Dales is a, it's a prospective cross-sectional study of um, patient reported allergies, really, um, and anaesthetist management of allergies, of allergy labels perioperatively. Um, so it's the largest prospective study in this area, and it's really a, a study in, in two parts. As Louise says, there's, um, there, there are two sub-studies, the patient study, um, and we did, we carried out stru semi-structured interviews um, with just over 21,000 patients across the UK, um, and, and also an anaesthetist study, which was a survey completed by almost 5,000 anaesthetists, and again, that was from, from all four countries in the UK. Um, and I think it's important to mention that um, it was a study designed for and run by the Research and Audit Federation of Trainees, which is 
really key to the success and that's really that's the that's the main that's the way really that we were able to interview so many patients um 213 sites were involved and each site was had um, an open data collection phase of three days so short and sharp at all of those sites within a study window, but it meant that we could collect some really fantastic data. Um, and obviously it was a huge effort from the, from the entire network um, and involved 1500 investigators, principal investigators and research nurses, um, which resulted in us being able to get these, um, these fantastic numbers. So a huge thank you really to everybody who was involved from a rough point of view. Um, we also used a number of automated systems to help us in setup. We used the REDCap system and we also had um, investigators had personalised sign up links so that we could track our data from, from, from which was being uploaded from the sites. Um, moving on to, to study findings, 21,219 patients took part and for, of those patients there were um, just over 6,200 who reported an allergy to a drug or a dressing. Um, there were other allergies reported, so th some some that involved food or, you know, other other substances. But we we in the paper we focused on the drugs and the dressing allergies because they would be the ones that would be important perioperatively. Um, and we found that um, so so the, the six thousand two hundred and fourteen patients representing just short of thirty percent of people come presenting for elective surgery are reporting um, some sort of previous adverse reaction to a drug or a dressing. Um, amongst these patients, they reported a total of 9,487 separate reactions, so clearly some people reporting multiple issues with multiple drugs and dressings. Um, and, of the, and then, as, as Louise said, we, we then we, we developed a, a risk stratification system. So this was entirely based on, based on patient history, so high level, um, you know, broad brush strokes in terms of which which of these allergies were like are likely to represent a, a, a true a, a true allergy rather than a side effect. Um, and we found that having um, we, we were able to risk stratify um, 8755 of those reported reactions so so great numbers. And we found that um, 28 percent would be would, were reported as having a something in the history that would cons be consistent with it being high risk. We had two further groups, the, the low risk group, and they tend they were typically GI upsets, non urticarial rash or unknown reactions. And we also had a third group, which was res reserved for serious reactions which but which were non-allergic so for i suppose a good example of those would be non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug associated gi bleeds or the obviously more rare occurrence of succapnea or mh and um, so we recognized that they were clearly serious reactions but not but not allergic in nature um we also the the anesthetist survey um we looked at um the the numbers of people who would be looking to cons um to discuss perioperative allergy with a patient preoperatively and we found that was only about a third of anesthetists would actually do that routinely and we had some other sorry, so, sorry Catherine just stop you there so that that was um the uh the risk of a a, a perioperative allergic reaction as a routine part of the pre-op assessment Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yes, so okay. this is yeah. Sorry, so this is this is the no, the number of anaesthetists who reported that um, that they would routinely discuss um, risk of risk of perioperative allergy with, with a patient at the routine preoperative visit. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, so to continue with sort of brief headlines from the anaesthetists, um, the anaesthetist part of the study, um, we had some other interesting findings. Um, some, some of which are reported in the penicillin paper, but we also found that there were there were some some knowledge gaps really amongst anaesthetists, and we were surprised that um, around um, that uh, there are still still a, a reasonable number of people who would um, avoid propofol, for example, in patients who report soy egg nut allergies, um, and the the. Um, we also, we also, um, as part of the patient survey, we um, we undertook follow up of patients in two specific groups. So people had either reported um, a problem with a penicillin or reported that they had um, a previous issue with an opioid. Because another important part of the study was um, trying to find out more about the ways in which patient reported 
reactions affect perioperative prescribing. Um, and with this, we found we had some quite we, we found that the, the, the nature of the, the type of drug that the patient was reporting a problem to actually had quite an impact on the way that an anaesthetist would be prepared to deal with that perioperatively. So, for example, 80% um, of people who were followed up with a, a report of an opioid allergy still received an opioid perioperatively, um, even those who were reporting a high risk, a high risk symptom, even among that group, 86% were still given an, opi an opioid perioperatively. Um, whereas we found that only 6% of people who reported a penicillin allergy were given a penicillin. And it's interesting to note that um, through our study, nobody who reported either of those um, drugs and were given them perioperatively actually had any sort of perioperative problem. What did, did you get a handle on um, the, the grade or experience of the of the anaesthetist? Can, can we explain the the gaps in knowledge by um, a, a lack of experience or relatively junior anaesthetists? Um, so the the vast majority of the people who responded were consultants. So we did ask for grade, but we couldn't really draw any conclusions about change in practice with seniority. Um, because, um, because as I say, that the, major the majority of respondents were, were consultants. They perhaps had trainees with them, um, but they were making the decisions on those lists. Mm -hmm. So the great majority um, of patient reported drug allergies would result, with obvious exceptions, as you've mentioned, uh, such as the opioids, but would by and large result in avoidance of that particular medication or, or, or related uh, or, or group of medications by the anaesthetist. Um, yes, particularly particularly with the particularly with the penicillin allergies, we we only followed up those two specific groups because we felt that um, practice may be different comparing one group with the other. Um, but we also wanted to pick um, fairly. Um, we also wanted to pick patient reported allergies that were that were coming that were coming up fairly frequently. So our, our top three um, patient reported um, culprits for previous problems were penicillins, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and opioids, um, mm. which really was the, the guide to why we picked those two patient groups to follow up. But yes, we did find that there were um, they do they do create um, um, well, that there are there are um, implications around perioperative management if you are a patient reporting um, an allergy to a to a drug or a dressing. Mm. I just wonder, Jerry and Alexi, as as allergists, what what your response would be to your anesthesiology colleagues referring you all those patients who'd reported a drug allergy. Well, we we sometimes run into that with penicillin, um, where. If penicillin is on the record, no matter what the, the reaction was, or you know, sometimes they'll get referred. Um, and then you realize, you know, you you talk to the the person and it, you know, was their uncle had penicillin allergy, so they thought they might, so they had it put on their their record. Um, you know, you see the the whole gamut. Um, and I and I think what, you know, and my questions too, kind of involving this is the logistics, you know, how do you really get the information that you need and then and then have enough time to, to act on it? Um, so I think this study was really helpful and just, it, it brings to the fore, you know, the extent of the problem, you know, where, you know, a third of the people come in with drug allergies on their, on their chart, but yet three quarters of those are probably not true drug allergies. And that does have significant implications as far as how these folks are managed. Um, so yeah, I think the, the other that, thing that yeah. was sorry. Oh no, the go, go was, ahead. The other thing that was interesting is it, it really shone a light on some of the variations in prescribing habits, which you might link back to lack of knowledge and understanding about allergy. Uh, but we, we can't say that from necessarily from our study, but we demonstrated some potentially quite unsafe prescribing in the face of penicillin allergy labels. So patients, some patients with very high risk sounding labels were given penicillin uh, and lots of patients with reactions which were clearly side effects avoided penicillin. And with opiates, as, as Caroline said, lots of patients with labels that really maybe should have been taken a bit more seriously, uh, you know, a related or, or identical opioid was, was prescribed. So 
I think the problem is that the, the mess of everybody, well, a third of patients coming in with some sort of allergy label just devalues um, the true, the genuine allergy. They're hidden um, in plain sight. So the, the ones that you really need to worry about are, are hidden by all these other ones, which are, are spurious. Um, so it does, it does lead to prescribing problems. But of course, mm. it doesn't answer the question of how to tackle that. <laughs> so how do you tackle that? Well, I mean, that's difficult. Uh, I mean, penicillin is the obvious one to focus on. It's consistently the, the most, you know, the, the, the commonest drug allergy label across all. I mean, we demonstrated that in the UK with this population. Uh, and I think our sample is probably fairly generalizable just because it's so large, but it's, it's the same in any similar piece of work that you look at in any healthcare system and in any patient population. So penicillin is the big one. Um, and I think the answer is that we don't know yet the best way to tackle that. Um, but for surgical patients, it's likely to be a, a preemptive allergy test. Uh, and the problem there is that we don't have the allergy uh, personnel to deal with that. There's not enough allergists to deal with this massive what, you know, tidal wave, really, of, of patients with a label. So there is lots of research at the moment underway to try and establish pathways for the very low risk patients, so the low hanging fruit of penicillin allergy labels um, to, be, to be tested outside of a, a standard allergy clinic. But it's far from clear yet how we can implement that and whether people will then anyway listen to the advice. One, one finding we did find from the penicillin study is that only half of anaesthetists or fewer than half in fact would give penicillin to a patient who's been labeled preoperatively even by an allergy specialist that was one of the questions in our penicillin uh, study so so it's by no means clear that even if you do the testing that people will follow the advice from that testing there's a, a, a disproportionate anxiety around penicillin allergy i sent a, a huge educational task um facing us a, facing mm. us ahead I, I mean if i if i can just think more more um, generally now in, in terms of um, how we um, progress patient safety um, in, in perioperative or around perioperative anaphylaxis. And um, one of the things that I'd like to ask Jerry and, and Alexei is, is about um, filling another of the gaps that, you, that Jerry mentioned beforehand, and, and that is the coordinated um, multidisciplinary work that um, uh, we're now seeing um, spread across the UK and obviously um, highlighted uh, or, or, or um, exemplified by, by Lena Garvey in Denmark um, of how we uh, can get anesthesiologists and allergists and immunologists to work together. Um, are, you, are you hoping to make progress there in the US, Jerry? Yes, um, and again, really, it's still just coming to the fore here in the U.S., and the, the difficulty lies in every medical center is set up a little bit differently. The way we've uh, approached it here at Mayo is we actually have a, a preoperative clinic, so patients go through and before their surgeries, now obviously there isn't time if it's emergent surgery, but for any type of planned surgery, you know, they, they are seen, and, and that uh, clinic is staffed by both anesthesiologists and internists. There they look at, you know, all the risk factors. You know, car it's not just allergy related by any means, you know, cardiac, uh, diabetes and all, et cetera. But we've made inroads with that group so that allergy is now on the list of things for them to assess. And if they're able to delabel, you know, just based on, oh, this history is very benign versus this needs further looked at, then we're able to see them to, to sort through things. But that, that crosstalk between anesthesiologists and allergists, I think is critical. We've also worked on that, you know, on the back end after an event um, to make sure that those folks do get evaluated then to, to see what, what caused the reaction, what can we do in the future uh, to prevent it. Um, so we're starting uh, along that path and spreading the word, so to speak. We're working through our major uh, allergy societies, the Academy and the College of, of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology uh, to 
to make this known an awareness and then it will be kind of up to individual centers to figure out how with the resources they have, how can they try and make something like this work? Okay, thank you. And and coming back to to, to Caroline, um, you mentioned RAFT, um, the, the, this uh, national network of um, trainees, anesthesiology trainees, um, interested in in audit and and research. And you demonstrated with this study the. The power of that um, resource. Um, does RAFT have any further plans for perioperative allergy research, or have they moved on to other things? Um, I think so. So there isn't there isn't another there isn't another national project planned around this topic. Although it may well be something which is suitable in the future. Um, I think that what RAFT does very well. Um, and really what we set out to do with Dales was perform um, a short um, snapshot type study without a long follow up arm to it. The, the, pro the problem with trying to do studies which have perhaps longer follow up is that they really become quite unmanageable for trainees who are trying to fit this in amongst um, all their all their shifts and you know long days and nights and things like that. So I think that the, the power really in raft as I see it, is collecting a huge amount of very good quality data in a in a short time frame, um, and that is that isn't to say that there there couldn't be another um, allergy topic in the future. Although, as I say, one isn't planned at the moment. I'm, I'm sure Louise might work on that for you. <laughs> um, okay, um, I think we've uh, come to the end of our our time. So um, I'd like to uh, thank. Uh, Louise and Caroline and Alexi and Jerry very much for um, talking about their papers, sharing their uh, research with us. I'd like to congratulate you all on uh, the work um, using uh, big data in two different ways, one retrospective and one prospective, um, to um, answer some questions and indeed to generate uh, further research questions that will take us forward in this field. So um, it's um, goodbye from me and um, goodbye from my colleagues. Thanks again for watching this BJA broadcast. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.